All right. If you have never been here for a member preach before, it's really simple. Let me, it just takes me a few minutes to explain it. It works like this. So people who are members, they get up and they preach. All right, you got it. All right. And the reason why it's so important is because this, this thing that we call discipleship is a participation sport, right? It's not a spectator sport. It's participatory. And these folks who are coming up and they're going to share their stories with us, this, they're participating in their faith and they're reflecting on their faith and they're reflecting on their journey and we all get blessed by it. So I, I say it's my favorite day of the year. It always is my favorite day. And this today does not disappoint in any way, shape, or form. The next, you're going to hear three people. They're going to be phenomenal. Um, so, and we're going we're gonna to mess up the service order a little bit uh, so that you're not hearing three people in a row. Um, but with that, you know what we do when we're welcoming up somebody, right, who's coming up for member preach. They might be nervous. They might be tired because they've already done it once. So are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, what? The only Richard Kern, ladies and gentlemen, bring it up, yay! Woo! Now, now, Cindy, that's how he wants to be greeted every morning. <laughs> it, 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 are, it already is, right? Damn. <laughs> the animals give me that most mornings, but really it's because I'm carrying the food. So, well, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, Crossroads, for the opportunity to participate in this year's member preach. Um, now, a month or so ago, uh, Cindy asked me, what are you going to preach on? And I said my topic was going to be God's faithfulness. Now, Cindy, having been to seminary and trained in preaching, lovingly said, that's too broad. So after some discussion and reflection, uh, my topic was refined to anxiety, perfectionism, and anger, a 60-year struggle, and God's faithfulness on that journey. And I just gave a hint of how old I was. If you're... They didn't get that first service. You guys are way better. Um, so earlier this summer, Joe gave a message on freedom, and he asked, when did you feel free? Now, I had an immediate response to that uh, in my head. And I invite you to guess my answer. Now, the multiple choice will go up on the screen now. Okay. Freedom, question mark. So your choices are, A, riding my bike as a young boy to get a Slurpee at 7-Eleven. B, standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon for the first time, which is a pretty impressive sight. Um, C, walking through the concourse at Detroit Metro Airport. Or D, taking the controls of a single-engine Cessna. We were flying over southern Ohio. I got to fly over Kings Island. Uh, it was pretty cool. You're going to have to wait a few minutes for your answer. <laughs> Give me about 10. Um, so lock in, remember, with final answer. So a little background. I am the oldest of five, or five children. Now, I am the textbook oldest child. And my picture literally could be next to the definition you'd see me. I moved five times growing up, the last time during my sophomore year in high school. So for over 10 years, I was the new kid at school trying to fit in. Now, every move deepened my anxiety and left me with no real friendships and no lasting relationships. There's literally nobody from high school other than Facebook now that I've kept in touch with. I learned to be the nice guy and to fit in easily. Now, I've described it as living life as a shadow. It was visible, but there was no real substance. I projected a very calm exterior, which belied the anxiety churning inside. As I grew up, I developed perfectionist traits to complement my anxiety. I don't recommend this. I said earlier, it's like putting icing on a bad cupcake. And it became the dominant factor in my life for 50 years. Maintaining that perfect facade is exhausting. The outside looks great, but the inside not so much. So what did the outside look like? I had a beautiful wife, a wonderful daughter, a perfect lawn, a good job, a nice house, 
a clean car. I bought black cars during that period. If you have any perfectionist traits, traits don't buy black cars. <laughs> Setting yourself up. I was a decent golfer, and I even kept a spreadsheet for all my golf clubs. So I had my distances. I had what loft, what lie, if there was any gaps. It was a great excuse. Now I buy more guitars, but <laughs> in the past I used it to buy golf clubs. I had my wedges all planned out for the weather and all that. That's kind of annoying. <laughs> So what was the inside like? Inside there was an anxious buzzing and a, never, a sense of never feeling fully present. I never felt like I fit in or I was good enough. I thought if people only knew what an imposter I am and I was afraid of the moment I'd slip up and they'd figure that out. I would count down the minutes until X was over so I could shut down. There was no peace, no joy, no rest, and no satisfaction. There was always one thing, I was always one thing away from having everything done on my list of things to do. I worked so hard for a day that would never come. And what did that perfectionism look like in my life? Well, in the past, it was the manicured lawn, the detailed car, not just clean. I mean, we're talking like the edges of, under the seats, clean. Um, I had very stylish banker suits. I had coordinating golf attire, pretty much a hat to match every shirt that I owned. I looked good when I walked up to that first tee. <laughs> The shot sometimes not so much. So now becoming a farmer has changed those aspects a lot. And you can see the cut on my finger. There is visual evidence. Um, but the darker side of my perfectionism is anger. And that anger was frequently directed at myself. Getting angry, expecting that I should know how to do blank, even if I've never done blank before. Getting frustrated when others don't do things the right way, when instructions come in a box and they're not laid out as they should be. The words in my head, <laughs> thankfully, don't always come out of my mouth. Um, getting defensive when, when my wife Cindy asks que she questions my performance, thinking, don't you know how hard I'm trying? Berating myself with, you are so stupid, over and over as I stare in the mirror. I can slam and break stuff. It's pretty much the polar opposite of what you see as fruit of the Spirit in the Bible. Now, that's a lot for me to get out and share, and it's a lot to process. So at this point, I want to go back to God's faithfulness. And it's so interesting how God works. And in my case, he used golf to draw me to him. Now, what did that look like? Well, after a 20-year hi hi hiatus, I started going to church in 1997. And how does a banker get involved at church? Well, you really have two options. You either get invited to join the finance committee or you join the golf league. I joined the golf league. Um, and at that time, my first wife was attending a Bible study called BSF, which stands for Bible Study Fellowship. And she would regularly suggest that I give it a try. My response, code word excuse, for not going was not being able to leave work in time to attend. Now, two years of playing in the golf league, which required me to leave work at 4 p.m., get that, 4 p.m., pretty much shattered my excuse that I couldn't leave work early to go to a 7 o'clock p.m. Bible study. You all are catching the math here. Um, finally, I, <laughs> I conceded. Um, I started Bible Study Fellowship on September 10th, 2001. Now, the next day, the world changed in many ways. And I eventually became a believer in the fall of 2001 when I finally admitted to God that I couldn't do my life on my own. And I asked him for help. He was faithful, and he knew what was to come that my perfect life was about to be exposed. A little more context. I was married in 1982 to my high school sweetheart, and we would have yesterday celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary. We met on December 1st, 1975, and you'll start to catch I'm pretty good on dates. <laughs> Not those kind of dates. I'm <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> In the guidance, <laughs> it's so nice that you're here, Cindy. 
we met in the guidance counselor's office in at Chatham Township High School in New Jersey, northern New Jersey, me moving in from West Virginia, and Brenda from Texas. So we were the two kids with slightly southern accents. We were assigned lockers E5 and E6 in the new kid wing. Now, Brenda grew up with an alcoholic mom and an absent father, and I lived in a home literally with a white picket fence. You can already see maybe <laughs> that's going to collide. Neither of us knew ourselves or how to handle the real stuff of marriage, especially conflict. We were married by a Catholic priest and an Episcopal minister, and then walked away from church for 15 years. The perfect appearance of our marriage hit a deep brokenness inside of it. Now, Brenda found the love that she was searching for in Jesus in 1997, and we started attending church again. And it was her gentle but persistent prompting that led me to attend BSF in 2001. Now, I feel that God knew the challenges we were to face beginning the next year. Deep and very painful issues in our marriage came to light in 2002, and they took four very long years to resolve. After a period of healing and restoration in our marriage, Brenda was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the spring of 2007. And 13 months later, I was a widower. And just a quick aside, the, the song, I Can Only Imagine, um, we, we did a special music song at her funeral, and that was the song that was played. So I kind of got chills when I heard you practicing that. So. Now, Isaiah 41.10, which will go up on the screen here, was my anchor verse during those difficult months and years. And it remains my favorite verse to this day. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now I met Cindy working backstage at Northridge Church's Glory of Christmas program in the fall of 2008, and we were married in 2010. After the honeymoon period, which was about a year, which is, I think, pretty good for marriages, um, some of the same issues that were present in my first marriage started to, hope, to show up in the second. And being the analytical banker that I was, I thought, what's the common denominator? Any guesses there? <laughs> it was me, the perfect me. And I realized I needed help figuring this out. I started seeing a counselor counselor regularly, and one of the first questions he asked me was, who are you? And at age 50, my response was, I have no idea. Now, I saw my therapist for about three years, and during that time, I was active in church. I was leading a men's group, participated in several other very uh, powerful ministries, and God worked mightily and brought healing through those things. But there was one important part of my component that was missing, or of my healing that was missing. That was medication. My deeply ingrained anxiety would often short circuit my healing. And I began taking Lexapro eight years ago to treat my anxiety, and I still take it to this day. It has made a huge difference in settling the noise that would cloud my thoughts in every situation. So, when did I first feel free? Chop it out here a little. Oh. All right, so remember your answers. <laughs> this is a, that's okay. So, when did I first feel free? And you've probably been wondering for the last 10 minutes when's he going to answer the question? The answer to the question is C. my walk through the Detroit Metropolitan Airport. Now, at the time, I flew frequently for my job. This was a very common thing for me to do, probably on a weekly basis. You go through security in the middle part of the airport, you go down the two escalators, and you hit the Sky Club's on the left, the duty-free shop on the right, the bookstore, the, you know, they get you, you know, $30 for a bag of nuts kind of thing. And so I hit the bottom of the escalator, and the airport's busy. 
at the time. You know, it was probably a Monday or Tuesday morning. And it was quiet. It was like the noise. This is about after a week or two of taking the Lexapro. The noise was somewhere down here. And I'm walking, and I'm looking at the shop, and I'm seeing people, and then I'm looking over here, and it's just this incredible quiet. And I thought, wow, this is what other people must feel. And I had, at age 53, I had never felt that before, walking into or through a situation. And someone came up to me after the first service, and I was like, that's it, the buzz was gone. And it has made a huge difference. I, I don't respond perfectly, but I can, I have time now to kind of stop. And it's like the noise isn't there and I can think through. And the answer now to my counselor's question, who am I? I am a uniquely created child of God, loved and valued by him. I matter to God and to those in my life. The promise in Isaiah 41.10 is real and it is true. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will strengthen you, help you, uphold you. He doesn't promise it will be easy. And many of those days from 2002 to 2008 were incredibly difficult. But he was there every step of the way, even when you don't see it in the moment. The lotion didn't help. I borrowed some lotion from Jen. Um, who am I? I still get anxious at times. And I'm, as Cindy will attest, <laughs> I'm not perfect. Um, I have quirks. I still struggle with my stuff, but I can name it now. And I have tools to help me. I have a voice, opinions, and preferences. If you ask me where I want to go to lunch, I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to say, where do you want to go to lunch? It's I'm in the mood for Mexican today, let's go. Um, it's okay and it's healthy to express them. I'm a husband, I'm a dad to my daughter Kristen who's coming to visit today. I'm a grandpa to three amazing little grandbabies, one of who is just a couple months old and Cindy's gonna meet him for the first time today. I'm a farmer, injured finger, <laughs> and I'm a guitar player, thankfully not on this hand. I'm a work in process, being formed more and more into the likeness of Christ each day. And I trust God's thoughts and ways way above my own. And I'm not a shadow anymore. So, thank you. In Jesus' holy name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> all right, so we are going to, we're going to go to our second uh, sermon of the day. So do that thing you do. And are you ready? The one, the only, Eric, everybody. Woo! And, and, and fresh batteries, man. Fresh batteries. You're good. Aren't I the lucky one? <laughs> well, thank you and good morning. So I will just uh, go ahead and start with my message. And uh, my message starts with a question. And that question is, what is your distraction from God? What can you not go a day without? Is it your phone, social media, or the Internet in general? Whatever it is, ask yourself, do I value this more than I value my relationship with God? These days, the thing I can't go a day without is coffee. <laughs> I would not say I value coffee more than my relationship with God, but every time I get my teeth cleaned, I tell myself, 
that's it, no more coffee. Or at least, you know, one regular size cup a day and that's it. But every morning when I get up at 4 a.m., that goes right out the window, no matter how strong my, may, my resolve may have been. But that was not always the case. For 15 years, prescription pills and alcohol took God's number one spot on my priority list. And even though growing up, my sister and I weren't raised in a very religious household, I did attend catechism and was taught about Jesus and felt a strong connection with him at a very young age. And for those of you who may not know anything about the Catholic Church, catechism is pretty much a school you went to after regular school when you were a kid, and you learned about you know, pretty much Mary and Jesus, and you had to do this before you could take communion. And even through my years of uh, drinking and drugging, I always believed in God. But I turned my back on him, shut God out. I wanted nothing to do with him or his ways. And as long as I ignored him, everything that was going on in my life, things would be just fine. Or so I thought. As long as I kept a tight grip on my bottle, I won't have to change anything, worry about anything, or do anything. I certainly wasn't going to hold myself accountable to myself, God, and the people I hurt just for loving me. And I think I just clicked the mic and turned it up. Did I? <laughs> but that's exactly what I did, and that was then, and this is now. And after everybody, including myself, had given up on me being anything than what I was, when I was at my lowest point and knew I had to change something but just didn't know how, or if it was even possible, when I was finally so broken, I had nowhere to turn but to God, that is when he came for me. That is when he started to bring me out of the darkness and into the light. I admitted to myself and to God that I was powerless over my addictions, and that I could no longer go on this way, and that I needed his help. When I finally got out of my own way, and not only asked God for help, but allowed him to help me, and also open up my heart and let him in, because for 15 years, I kept my heart closed. Nothing got in, nothing came out. That was my defense. But when I let him in, the miracle began. The first thing God did was bring me to an AA meeting, and AA brought me here. And I'm proud to say it's now been almost five years since I've had a drink of alcohol or a prescription narcotic. Thank you. I can completely relate to what Rich was talking about, that constant buzzing. It never stopped. It was, there was no rest and there was no peace during those years, you know, always worried. Really just waiting, just waiting for the hammer to come down. You know, that's what it was. And why is it taking so long? You know, but I also have to say that my love and gratitude for God, AA, and all of you is unconditional because all three did nothing but make me feel loved and welcomed and without judgment. So when I hear Joe and Dave talk about standing firm in Christ and wearing the armor of God, I think about the Israelites and all that God did for them. I think about how Moses led them out of Egypt and out of slavery and how Joshua led them across the Jordan River into the land that God had promised their fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. I think about how God fulfilled every promise he had made to the Israelites and how after all they had been through, after everything they went through, they abandoned God and worshipped the false images of God of the nations that were there before them. They did this even though God specifically instructed them not to do this. So God's anger burned against the Israelites until they smashed and burned the false images of Baal and the golden calves, and the Asherah poles, and the high places, and humble themselves before the Lord, God of their ancestors. So I ask you this, what is your false idol? What is your distraction from God? As you think about that, I would like to leave you with some scripture. The first one is Galatians 5.1. Christ has liberated us into freedom, therefore stand firm, and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. And the second one, which is a little more truly personal to me. I heard this in the meditation class. It has uh, 1 Peter 1.6. You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have, a, you have had to be distressed by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, 
more valuable than gold, which perishes. I have such a hard time with that word, perishes. Though refined by fire, may result in the praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So I'd like to leave you and myself with a challenge, and that challenge is this. Define and identify your false idol. And that could once again be your phone, political figure, celebrity, and uh, I also have to add, I'm not telling you to leave the church and smash your phone on the sidewalk outside. And once you identify it, pick any random day and give it up for that one day. For that one day, use the time that you would usually use on whatever your false idol is, luxury, entertainment, social media, whatever it may be, use that time to focus on God. Thank you. when I turn it on. It's shocking. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. I thank you for Eric. I thank you for how you're moving in his life. I thank you. I thank you that he had the courage to respond to your call. And we thank you for everything that's happened since then and everything that's continuing to happen. So just continue to love him and guide him and walk him, walk with him on his journey. And we look forward to seeing all the things you'll do in his life. In Jesus' holy name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, well, so as you, as you sing, as you sing the, the words to this song and you reflect on what Rich just brought us and what Eric brought us, you just let, if, if you've got the buzzing in the head, right, just let it get washed away and, and let God's freedom wash over you. Uh, and it is well. But it isn't the song. So if you guys would rise, it, 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 there's the song. <laughs> you unravel me with the melody. You surround me with the song.
Amen. Guys, can grab a seat. Our third and our final preacher today. What an only Amy! Good morning. Good morning. It's still morning. We have 15 minutes. It's still morning. <laughs> How you doing, guys? I'm not usually down here, so it's it's different. I'm up there, and I hide behind people, and it's great. And I sing harmony, and now you get to hear me talk for like 15 minutes. I'm actually going to. Part of it is a song. <laughs> so, just for you. <laughs> So I expect participation. It's a call and response song. You should know it. No worry. So Jeff and I have been coming here for about 13 years. And for most of those 13 years, I've heard Joe talk. Obviously, it's not the point. But he's asked us. He said, everyone has a message. Every member has a message. Every single one of us. There's something on your heart that you have to speak about. Have to speak about. No one's going to make you. But at least the last four, I've had a question stuck in my mind. And that question, does God have a favorite flower? One that he still starts every spring and he makes bloom and gets started. And I know it's hard to think about winter in August and what comes is the spring. I feel like I finally have an answer to that question. In the days when winter is dragging on, and it feels like it's going forever, and you'd give almost anything to see the grass start growing and the flowers bloom, what little flower pops its purple head through the snow? The crocus. Sometimes it's yellow, white. It's so happy, that little pop of color. Now, crocus bulbs need to be planted in the fall. Once the winter hits, the bulb goes dormant. The idea is to plant it early enough so some roots can get established before the winter freeze. The bulb goes dormant. It's still alive. It's waiting for the right conditions to bloom. Our winters are long enough to forget about the flowers that we see growing in other people's gardens. But the gardener usually remembers. I say usually, because usually. <laughs> the gardener knows where the seeds and the bulbs have been planted and what conditions will cause them to grow and bloom. Just like those flowers, there are some conditions or some truths that we can't quite grasp without a little hard in our lives first. I would go so far as to say that God's greatest promises and truths are revealed to us once we experience our worst times. Now, I've heard these my whole life. These are promises and truths that are still true, even when you have not experienced the right conditions to really understand the message. They're easy to use. They get used carelessly. I like to think of them as bubbly truths. Bubbles. Super light, but the bubbles, they come up. All right. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, yeah. But in Nehemiah, the people were crying. They were feeling convicted after hearing the law be read. And Ezra told them not to be sad because the joy of the Lord is your strength. This isn't going to last forever. It'll be better tomorrow. I mean, yeah, it's true. But like with all of these, something hard came first. And in this circumstance, it was a dedication of a temple. And they were referring poetically to the darkness of pain and the brightness of peace and joy. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Don't worry. God won't give you more than you can handle. We hear that one a lot, don't we? <laughs> well, in Philippians 4, verse 6 does say not to be anxious, but Paul also tells us what to do instead and where to focus on God. In verse 13, he isn't doing anything on his own, like it so often sounds. He's talking about being content, even in a low place. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
and I can do all this through him who gives me strength. It's not coming from us. Now, I've heard these in songs, too. They're so deep in my history that the song is more a part of me than the truth that those songs are proclaiming. Here it is, Sherry. <laughs> so the joy of the Lord is my strength. I think this, this one's way back. Nobody sings it anymore. It's the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And man, it just, it gets in there, right? You hear it and you sing it, but it's more about the song. The other one is fun. This one requires participation. I think enough of you know it. <laughs> I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Yeah. Down in my heart. Yeah. Down in my heart. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. And it goes on, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And we are so happy, but happy is so different from joy and peace. It's all true. The way I hear them being used dismisses the need to go through the trial. My childish understanding was that I should feel the strengthening hope and the peace and the joy all the time. Any hardship would be short-lived and any heartbreak would pass quickly. No tragedy would rock my world. Those biblical promises and hopeful truths were given to people already in the depths of pain. Hard conditions that they needed in order to allow the message to bloom and be understood. Now, some of you may already know the story behind the hymn, It Is Well. In 1873, hymnist Horatio Spafford sent his wife and four daughters to England on a ship and he was going to follow on another one. He had a little business to finish first. But the first ship went down at sea. He heard from his wife. Saved alone. What shall I do? She was the only survivor from their family. Now the captain of the ship taking Horatio to England knew what had happened and sent word when they passed the spot where his four daughters had died. And while they passed by, he wrote the words to the hymn. One word in what he wrote from the first verse is different, and I think it's significant. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know it is well. It is well with my soul. It has taught me to know more than just saying, it's not just words. Now, no, go away. Yeah. my best friend, I like to call her my brain. She might be watching this now. Hi, Becca. Um, she's a writer. She had a tragedy in her family. Her uncle, an absolute pillar of strength and faith, passed away a few months ago due to COVID. She wrote a poem that absolutely floored me. She wrote it with one of her cousins, I get to see the rough draft. I get the special. <laughs> and she kept telling me it wasn't done yet. She wanted to edit it. I said, okay, but can I have this draft back? Because I need this one. The terrible truth about peace. The thing no one tells you about the peace that passes all understanding is that it doesn't come alone. It sneaks in with the shock, the sudden crying fits, and the moments you can't catch your breath. It clings to you as you crumble from the inside out. It rides along to distract you when you notice that life keeps moving even though you are certain the earth has stopped and shattered. That's the thing no one tells you. The peace persists whether you want it to or not. The peace carries you across the bridge as it breaks behind you. The peace won't let you drown in the river no matter how much it feels like you need to, you want to, you should. The worst thing that no one tells you is the understanding doesn't come. The puzzle never fits together again. That is what the peace is for. It's the peace that passes our understanding. It's not going to make logical sense. 
Focusing on the New Testament and Jesus' words about peace gives more weight to those bubbly truths. Matthew 6 has some of my favorite verses. The section is titled, Do Not Worry. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There is so much peace in that section. Do you hear it? I hear, guys, I've got this. I know what you need. You aren't accomplishing anything by worrying and troubling yourselves. I hear how much God cares about things that we would dismiss as insignificant. In Matthew 8, we get to hear how Jesus brought calm to a literal storm. He got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. They were so sure. Isn't that what we do too? We get scared of our circumstances, caught up in what's going on in our lives. Sometimes it can be hard to remember that the peace won't let you drown in your situation. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? And he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. In John 14, Jesus starts talking to the disciples about when he will be leaving them and sending the Holy Spirit. They are so understandably upset about losing their friend and teacher. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Later, there's a section titled, The Disciples' Grief Will Turn to Joy. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice. No one will take away your joy. I have told you these things so that in me you have may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. It's the peace that passes understanding. It's still there when nothing makes sense. It's still there when we're stuck in our grief and the times that we're worried about life circumstances. We need to let go of our need to understand and trust that if God is watching over the flowers, the birds, the grass, and even the weather, that he is also watching over our grief, and we can trust him. We are called to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and not lean on our own understanding. When we let go of our need to understand and we lean into the peace, we get to experience the joy that comes in the morning, and that joy becomes our strength. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Today I challenge you to lean into the peace of God and let go of the desire to understand. We can do all of this through him who gives us strength.
All right, it's my honor and great privilege to give you the one, the only Andy. <laughs> Have a great job. Thanks, Drew. Well, good morning. Thanks for the warm welcome. That was great. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'd like to ask you all to close your eyes for a moment and picture a river. Okay, everybody got it? What images did you create? Anyone? Fishing? Rocks? Trees? Lush greenery? The noise? The babbling brooks and such? Great. So, now, what if that river was on fire? What kind of emotions does that stir up inside you? Fear, sadness, disgust, right? You see, I believe our hearts, our emotions, our gut, it alerts us to issues and problems and things that we need to uh, take care of and resolve. But without God, without God, you know, our thoughts cause us to, to perhaps make rash decisions, <clears throat> excuse me, and make, uh, take actions that basically lead to a lot of unintended consequences. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. He's a retired General Motors engineer, and um, one of the things in his retirement that a topic he's interested in is uh, this idea of sustainability. He's from the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, and right now the Upper Peninsula has experienced a large population loss. The population is also getting older in the UP. And so a lot of the communities are concerned about how are they going to sustain themselves in the future. And a subtopic of that is kind of the, the natural resources, the environment, and the sustainability there. And my buddy, uh, he encouraged me to watch this documentary on Netflix. It's called a life on this planet. Yep. Oh, thank you. No, I'm good. And uh, generally speaking, this, uh, the documentary is about essentially uh, the human consumption of, sorry, <laughs> thought I could do this without these, but you know, <laughs> aging, right? I tried, right? Um, but essentially, it's about the human consumption of, of all of the Earth's natural resources and the destruction and damage that we're all doing to the planet, right? The deforestation of the rainforests in South America, strip mining, and, you know, and all the other pollution, uh, the waste, and all of the byproducts of our production. But as I'm watching the, the, uh, the documentary, you know, I'm starting to get a sense that uh, it's, it's not only making me feel bad, but it's trying to convince me that I am bad, that we are bad. Humans are bad for the planet. But then again, I, I go to Genesis, the, the first book of the Bible, the first chapters of the Bible, and where God is talking about creation, right? He makes the earth, he creates all of the vegetation and the plants. Then he creates life, the, the, the fish and, and animals. And then he creates man, right? And he stands back and he reflects and he says, this is good, very good. So my frustration, as I'm explaining to my buddy what, with the documentary, was that it misses the part about creation. Right? If one has faith in creation or intelligent design, wouldn't the Creator, God, know if the earth could sustain humanity? Truly, I mean, if humanity is on the path to unsustainability, I mean, either God is going to reveal to us the wisdom and the knowledge that we need to, to avoid any calamity or catastrophe, or God's going to allow the end of times to progress. My friend pointed out, though, also, and correctly, by the way, that uh, the Bible also talks to us about stewardship and being good stewards of the planet. 
right? And that our faith requires action. So then at the end, I kind of had to go back and reflect. And my biggest objection to the, the, was how the documentary, how the information was presented. Because for me personally, I tend to reject, you know, when someone's trying to intimidate me or shame me or scaring me into, into taking action. I mean, I agree with the fact that humans do damage to the planet. You can, you can see it all around. We, we destroy things on the earth. But also, you know, my faith tells me that the earth is more durable than we think it is, that we give it credit for. You know, I, God knows we're going to mismanage our stewardship responsibilities, right? We mess things up all the time in many ways. You know, and I think he anticipated that in his creation's design. And the reason I believe this is because, you know, when the Rouge River caught fire in 1969, right? I was, we were all little, Joe and I were all, you know, we're, we're all littler back then, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the punny, the, actually after they got the fire out, you know, put, Public sentiment, say that really fast, public sentiment uh, began to change. And, and uh, you know, even though we believed that the, the Rouge was a casualty of industrialization and progress and a lost cause, um, maybe we could do better moving forward. And so throughout the 70s, grade school years, you know, a lot of grassroots organizations started up, work parties and things like that. And, you know, everybody's pulling on their rubber boots, putting on their rubber gloves, getting dirty, you know, wading into the river and, you know, pulling out old tires, you know, rusty old shopping carts. Occasionally there was a car. And this was happening all throughout the 70s. So we're just, you know, kind of stepping in and cleaning things up. And then around the mid-80s, it got more organized in an organization form called Friends of the Rouge. And it's still going on today, and they host annual events to, you know, different cleanup projects for the Rouge River. You know, and the one thing that we're seeing some 50 years later after the fire is that the earth is repairing itself. The river is, is healing itself. And, um, you know, God's doing this really through his intended you know, the, the stewardship that he, he, that he entrusted us with, and we're doing it. And so the river is healing. We're seeing the, the water quality improve. It's not great, but it's improving. Wildlife is returning. Huh? It's better than it was. It's a lot better than it was, for sure. It's not burning anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, a plant, you know, and people are coming back to the river and the parks and, you know, for recreation and things like that. And so, so my thinking is, is towards like, if, if sustainability, if we keep this concept or idea of sustainability separate from our faith, then humanity is, will never uh, achieve a sustainable future. You know, our creator is the key. And so after, after explaining this all to my, my friend, you know, he's also a Christian as well. Um, he concluded, so if, if that's the case, then we're all set. So the one thing that I wanted to, to talk about, right, is that true stewardship requires deep discernment. And Jesus said it best in Luke 14, 28, you know, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to, to see if you have enough money to complete it? Uh, and at the time, Jesus was talking with Pharisees, and uh, he was talking about the cost of discipleship. But I also think this is, applies to our planning and uh, the stewardship responsibilities that we have as well. You know, so kind of as I, as I wrap all of this up, I want us to all think about how we talk to one another. Can we try to listen and hear one another better? You know, Everyone knows, and we've seen, you know, all of the shouting back and forth and the talking past each other and how all of that, how well is that working for us, really, right? It's, 
not solving any problems. We still got all of the same problems and we're not solving anything. So, you know, I, you know, if we, we just, I just be nice, <laughs> right? You know, and, and the other thing that I also need you to know, right? This message here today, really, I needed, I needed to hear this message, right? As much as anybody, if not more, because all the tough I told you that we're not supposed to do, I do, right? And I think really the only way that God could get me to listen was for me to give the message today, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, and after one of our member preach classes, you know, I'm driving home and, uh, you know, was a, a really good guy. Joe gave me a lot of good guidance and everything. And, and we talked a lot and I'm pulling out of the parking lot here at, uh, uh, at Crossroads and song comes on the radio, uh, perfect timing. The song is different by a Micah Tyler, right? And Micah's singing about, you know, God changing him, him losing his self and becoming more like Jesus. I want to be different. I want to be changed. I want to be different. I want to be changed. Let's go be different. Had to turn it on and be for in order for it to work. So thank you for sharing that and just hear what he said, right? Like this thing that we're on, we call it a journey for a reason because God still has work to do with all of us, including me, including Dave. You know, he says, I, the reason why I had to preach that message is because God needed to, you know, give it to me. I mean, just think about Dave and I. Like, God has a lot to teach us, obviously, <laughs> right? So he just keeps like, no, you got in September, it's both you guys, right? You got to. <laughs> so, all right. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. I thank you for my brother and my friend Andy. I thank you for the man that he is. I thank you for how he listens to you, how he seeks to follow you, and I thank you that you're, you're with him on the journey. So continue to guide him and lead him and, and continue to guide us through his words to us this morning. In Jesus' holy name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. Great job, man. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> all right, Andy, no pressure for the next one uh, when, when she comes down, all right, so, um, so obviously it's Andy's wife who's getting up next, um, Kara, not Kara, other Andy, no, Kara, are you sure? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so. Would you do the thing you do as I introduce our next and our second and our last one for today? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only Liz. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Is, is the green light on? You're, you're all set. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Liz. <laughs> So, have you ever had to take a huge leap of faith and trust in God? Have you ever been called crazy for doing it? Well, I know how that feels because it happened to me. At the beginning of 2020, right before everyone's lives changed, my life had a huge change in it. As of January of last year, I had worked at um, Kroger for about nine years. I had a decent pay rate. I had a lot of time and sweat put in. Um, I had vacation time. I had every, you know, it was, it was a pretty, you know, decent job. But I was feeling like my life needed a change. Uh, I needed... I felt like I needed, my kids needed me more than I was there for them. That's a hard feeling to have. Um, my kids were growing up and I was missing big parts of it. My feelings were cemented when my then one-year-old son, Connor, had taken his first steps and I missed it. I was at Kro Kroger and I missed it. 
And then, not, not but maybe like a week later, my then nine, eight, nine-year-old stepson, he's 10 now, so whatever, do the math. <laughs> He said to me, he said, and it was totally like the most serious tone ever. He said, Liz, I miss you because I never get to see you because you're always at work and I never get to spend time with you. Well, let me tell you how hard it was to not burst out into tears looking at him saying that to me. But these two events, they hurt me on a level undescribable and it wasn't Patrick's intention to hurt me like he was just expressing his feelings I didn't know what to do I was kind of stuck like on one hand my kids needed me to be there for them they needed me but then they needed me to go to my job and make money and pay bills so it's like what do I do how how do I change this to accommodate all of it well, it, so as Christians, what do we do when we're stuck and we don't know where to go or which direction to take? We pray. So that's what I did. I prayed for God to show me the right path, to show me the way I should move forward to, you know, be there for my kids and still make money to take care of them. And I prayed a lot. And um, about a week or so after all this like revelation and all that stuff, and I started the praying and looking for God's answers, my mom called me. And she said, she's like, I know you've been talking about making a change and wanting to venture out beyond Kroger. She said, well, Walmart's hiring overnight, full-time benefits, weekends off, set schedule. She's like, would you be interested? I said, yeah, I'll apply. Well, I applied and I was going through all those processes before like I accepted the job. And I was, I, I just, I got scared because it's like, how do I walk away from a job that I've held for almost a decade? You know, I know the managers, my boss knows me. I know the job, I'm an expert at my job to something that I've never done before. Never even heard of it before. So I was, I was really scared. And um, and so as I'm struggling with this decision, should I make this leap of faith? Should I trust in God that this is the answer he was giving me? I'm brought back to Luke 5, Verses four through seven. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night and haven't caught anything, but you say so. I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large amount of fish that their nets began to break. So what this verse says to me is when you trust in God and what he puts in front of you, you will be rewarded. And they were rewarded with a mass amount of fish. And I just knew after reading the, those verses that I needed to make the, I needed to, I needed to do this. I needed to take my leap of faith. And it paid off. The job at Walmart was great. It was wonderful. I got more time with my kids. I, I, I was making this just about the same amount of money and it was, you know, it was a pretty good job. So I was pretty happy with myself. But about six months after I started my job at Walmart, I was getting into the swing of things, you know, getting to know all my managers. They were always giving me compliments. And um, yeah, I was pretty happy with myself. And I was scrolling on Facebook and I saw that Crossroads Christian Early Education was hiring. <laughs> I'm like, I've always wanted to work with kids. It's been a dream of mine since I was probably about six years old. Um, so in that moment, I didn't even hesitate. I applied because 
I just learned six months ago that when God puts something in front of you, it works out. So I, I didn't have the turmoil I had had before. And I'm so glad I did because here I am a year later. I love my job. I get to work with kids all day long. I love the people I work with. And I get to spend all day with my son. Like, I mean, <laughs> it's, yeah, win-win. It's best of all the worlds. So my advice to all of you is if you are ever faced with a turmoil of trusting in God, I say to you, take your leap of, take your leap of faith, let down your net, because you'll be rewarded. Um, so there are people in the room who, who were in the room all those years ago when we said, let's, what if we start a preschool and what if we start a daycare? And one of the things that we talked about at that time was, yes, it's taking care of the kids, but providing jobs in the community is also a ministry. And here all these years later, you see the fruit of that, of pr the providing jobs as ministry and you get to hang out with Connor and I you know I'm not back there very often but when I peek my head back there or I walk through um, you got people like Liz loving on those kids back there you got people like Katie loving on those kids back there and had Michaela at one point was you weren't there a couple of times right <laughs> uh, it's, and not to call out um, uh, Emily and Jillian uh, here, but the next generation of college kids who end up working like in the sun, just saying, you know, <laughs> at some point. Um, but it's, it's an important ministry that you all help provide by supporting, by supporting that. So, so thank you for that. And great job on your message. <laughs> All right. All right, let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. I just thank you so much for Liz, the heart that you've put in her, the love that you've put in her, how she cares and how she cares for kids. I get to, I get to see it. And it and it's a blessing to them, and it's a blessing for all of us to see. So continue to be in her life. Continue to guide her and lead her, and just help her cast that net. And fill it with your love, and fill it with your grace, and fill it with your goodness as she walks with you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. All right.